we're watching you. Okay, sure. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you. All right, thank you, Dina, again, and thank you, um, thank you, everyone, for welcoming me here today. It's a pleasure to be here with a group of people who can relate to our experience as a special needs family. <coughs> if you are a parent of a child with special needs, then you are in a very special tribe. We know better than anyone that it takes a village. Teachers, special educators, clinicians, and therapists. Mm -hmm. I am the CEO of Team Christopher. <laughs> Andrew and I know what it's like to get a diagnosis of autism and then have to figure out the road ahead. And it's not easy. Christopher needs a lot of extra support and we are very lucky to have the resources to give him what he needs so that he continues to make progress. But so many families in our country, like places right here in Iowa, Families are confronted with this reality about their child, that they have access to nothing. And that breaks my heart. Not being able to provide your child with what he or she needs is terrifying. Or worse, not knowing what your child needs. It is absolutely critical that we provide families like ours with options for things like alternative therapies and childcare things that are currently not available in our healthcare system. Andrew is the only one running for president to talk about these things. We are the first family to be running for president, publicly embracing the fact that we are a special needs family, like so many millions of families across this country. People come up to us every day to thank us for spreading this awareness, but beyond awareness, Andrew is the only candidate that has policies that will provide families like ours with options that we so desperately need. Options that would give our children their best chance to succeed. That's why I'm so excited to be with him here today, speaking with all of you about this issue that is so near and dear to us and so important for our humanity as a country. So now, it's my pleasure to welcome the next President of the United States, my husband. And then when we got the diagnosis, we said, oh my gosh, this explains so much. And now we know what we have to try to do. And since then, Evelyn really has been the CEO of Team Christopher. I love you for it, baby, and I'm so grateful to you. People sometimes thank me for running for president. I say with absolute sincerity, thank my wife. <laughs> One, because she let me run for president in the first place. And two, because she's the one who's been sacrificing much more uh, in the family, keeping us whole, whole and strong and being our rock. I'm so pleased to be here with you all to talk about our experience. And I share Evelyn's passion for the fact that we need to do much, much more for families across the country. And we're in a magical place called Iowa, so if you say we can do more, we can do more. What do you think? Yes. Yeah. Yeah.
Alright, actually, here. I'm under direction to uh, thread it underneath the table. I can help you with that. I can help you with that. There. I got it. All right. Wonderful. So yeah, we're going to start with just some conversation. I'm on the spectrum and I have a question. Well, honey, if you don't mind waiting about 10 minutes, we are going to open it up for audience questions, okay? Sounds right. good. Thank you. All thank right. you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your patience. I know this is a tough situation for a lot of people. Um, so I'm Dina Bashara, and I'm a co-founder of the Iowa City Autism Community. Thank you so much for being here, and I was so excited when the campaign approached us to do an event like this. It's fantastic. I'm also the mom of a sixth grade boy who's autistic. Um, so I just want to hear a little more about you guys and your experience with parents, and everyone specifically, if you would just mind talking a little bit about your children, especially Christopher, um, what he's like and what life is like for you guys. Process to your baby. Feel free to chime in. He's your kid too. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. He actually resembles me yeah, quite, quite well, greatly. He's a, he's a little bit of a mini me. I don't know if you've seen the pictures. Um, so, what can we say about Christopher? You know, he's uh, he's such a joy. He is this happy kid. He's a very happy child, and um, he just says what's on his mind. You know, and um, one of the reasons why he it was we didn't get the diagnosis until quite later mm -hmm. uh, when he was four years old is because he was always this very chatty kid mm -hmm. he would talk and talk and talk so he's verbal mm -hmm. um, but he kind of just talks at you mm -hmm. <laughs> not, um, not much of a listener <laughs> 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 um, maybe not so unusual yes, yeah yes <laughs> and and that's what uh, that was it was such a gift when we finally um, figured out what it was. I mean, it was obviously um, difficult. You know, mm -hmm. hearing that your child has autism is always, I can imagine, difficult. Um, it's not something that you imagine for your child exactly. before your child is born. And um, but the more difficult thing is, you know, figuring out what the road ahead looks like because it, it was a blessing for us to know because, you know, parents just want information. We love our children no matter what. And we know how special our children are and how much they have to offer our family. Um, you know, Christopher has brought so much to our family. He made us parents. Um, and so we're so grateful to him for that. Um, but, you know, he, he can have a very bright future um, if we can figure out what it is um, to help make him successful and whatever that looks like for him. So. You know, that's what we want to provide families across this country, um, is just options so that their children can live their best life. And uh, I don't know what you want to add to it. Uh, I have so much to add. But I, one of the things I, I'd say is as a dad, I remember Christopher running outside. He was, I think, either three or four. And Christopher is very uncoordinated. Uh, and when he would run, he literally would just sort of wait for him to lose his balance and, and fall, and then after he fell, he'd be very upset. Um, and so then when he was running, like, instead of being like, great, like, you know, my, my son's running outside, it's like, oh, no, okay. and then you're like, sort of like... Or like, you know, always like, holding then, your breath. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, uh, always holding your breath. So, like, you, you and mm -hmm. I understand what uh, that feels like for parents, uh, and it brings us tons of happiness and joy in large part because he, he is a very... Uh, happy, good-natured kid. The question is, how do we make it so that there is a runway for years to come, not just for him, but for families around the country? Mm -hmm. Because the reality is, autistic children often become autistic adults. Mm -hmm. Special needs children <laughs> often yes. become special needs adults. And it's a weird way of happening. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and right now, in many ways, I think special needs families are at the forefront of a particular challenge that actually applies to the entire country. Which is right now, we've all been collectively brainwashed to think that economic value and human value are the same things. And one of the traps that special needs families fall into is to say, well, if you had the right organization or employment opportunity, then my son or daughter would be able to contribute. Uh, and that is very true. But that should not be the point. You know, like, because if your child is nonverbal and is not going to plug into an organization that, that's even accommodating, 
we need to make this country work for them too. We need to rewrite the rules of this economy to work for human beings. And those special needs families are at the forefront of this. This is actually very much a universal issue because we're all right now treating ourselves and each other like we're inputs into this giant capital efficiency machine and it's tearing us apart. Over time, it's going to do much, much worse. So this is, in many ways to me, like we all know it uh, most personally, uh, but it's up to us to lead the country in the right direction. with me and also um, my son wasn't diagnosed when he was five also because he was very verbal at an early age and his first words were at nine months so it kind of threw us you know off track for a while but I really relate to what you're saying about it kind of being relief like oh all these pieces are fitting together and now we can figure out how to support him more mm -hmm. um, and so another question I wanted to ask is you know as a parent too, I think what I hear from so many parents being involved in this world is there's such a sense of panic when they find out <coughs> that their child is autistic um, and I always encourage people just to take a deep breath. I wish that someone had told me to take a deep breath and just kind of chill out a little bit and really focus on my son as a human to be understood rather than a problem to be solved. And that really, and it, it really is him being as a human first because I think that for many years that got lost when we're talking about autistic people, mm -hmm. the humanity of autistic mm -hmm. people. I'm just wondering if that resonates with you at all. Oh, very much yes. so. Yeah, there, there's this natural human desire to fit in, particularly when you're young. Uh, and for better or for worse, our schools don't have the resources to be able to accommodate people who have different learning profiles or different neurological profiles. One of the things I'm saying to folks is that special needs is the new normal. And trying to say that I'm going to like normalize my child should, again, not be the point. Um, just, like our schools being under resourced is not our kids fault <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, like the, okay. and right now many how many of you all are educators uh, since they're, they're, so one of the things that uh, I want to fight for in our schools is that we need to lighten up on the standardized tests that make it feel like our kids are all like, in the <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, did you all know that the SAT was originated during World War II as a means to identify which kids not to send to the front lines? Yeah. No. And, 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 and now we use it every year, like every year in wartime. We're pummeling our kids with this wartime tool. <laughs> and our teacher's behavior is being shaped in ways that they know is not best for their students, our children. Uh, so this desire to fit in, while it's very natural and human, uh, we have to be emphasizing people's individual attributes and humanity and champion that. Uh, because the fact is, right now, a lot of the people who approach problems differently are actually going to help move our country and our society in the right direction over time. I know we had, I think, an autistic young man in the way back. I would sure like to get his question in here if we can pass this back to him. Excuse me. Oh, that mic me. is cool. I'll, 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 walk, I'll walk up. Okay, okay. so you will put, head it back your way where he is, and then if you could uh, just pass Let's it back up, up when you're done. That'd be yeah, terrific. Hello everyone, my name is Nathaniel Gabronski. Not only, not only am I on the spectrum with Asperger's, I'm also an autism advocate. I have clients in 17 states dealing with different federal and state agencies where people with autism are having a hard time dealing with their states. Something I've done a lot of research and a lot of work on. One of the major problems I'm coming across with people with autism is that their families is financial. 98% of all people born with autism, they're not able to qualify for SSDI or even able to work enough hours to qualify for a social security retirement before they hit 65. They are lifelong uh, limited to only SSI, which is only $753 where the SSDI or, or retirement benefits they could possibly earn be up to, for, uh, up to $1,400. There's nowhere in this country, and I have looked, that you can live off of $753, and trust me, I've looked. Um, there's a simple thing that can be changed, and I would really like to see you talk about this, even though you're not a sitting legislator, by making the people who are, and say they're such advocates, 
talk about this, you can have a huge impact today. SSI requires that if you have, if you're disabled before the age of 22, um, you can get SSDI if one of your parents is either dead or deceased. If they are not, you only qualify for the SSI. If you get married, you lose it. If they can control where you move to, how much money you can try to earn. It's after $89, every dollar you, every two dollars you make, you lose a dollar, and you can lose your health care. You can lose everything. It's it's basically a form of control over people who they don't seem to be normal. That they're a surplus population. And I would like to see that. I, I actually have my my SSI list. I can show anyone who wants to what people are going through the hoops and, and reevaluations every year. Threat of losing everything every year. And I just want you to talk about that. Thank you. I love this question so much because this is exactly what we need to change. We need to change an oppressive bureaucracy that somehow questions your ability slash disability at every turn. And I've talked to hundreds, maybe thousands of Americans around the country who live in fear. Live in fear of having these benefits taken away from them by this inhuman, punitive bureaucracy that we can sense is always looking for a way to nickel and dime us. You know, like the job is supposed to be to improve our lives and make our lives better. And I've talked to hundreds, even thousands of Americans who wanted to get out there and do more. Wanted to either volunteer or work in the community, but they were afraid they would lose their benefits. They were afraid if they worked past a certain amount that they would start losing money. And if you have a permanent annuity, you're not going to do anything to jeopardize that. You know, it's like if, if I had an opportunity you were excited about, you had a balance against something that you rely upon for your survival, like a reasonable person will say it's not worth the risk. So we need to reverse the incentives of these programs so instead of keeping us down, they help elevate us. They make us stronger and healthier. They don't punish you for things like getting married. They don't punish you for having two parents who are alive. <laughs> you know, like, these things have, have nothing to do with our worth as, as a person. Uh, and so I would like nothing more than to reform these like rules that are supposed to keep us like from cheating the system. Like we're being cheated right now by a system that's keeping us down instead of bringing us up. I'm going to change those laws as president. So I promise. Because you know, our, our children now are four and seven, so we're still sort of just getting started. Um, and there's a long, long road ahead. And I think about that all the time, even though I don't know the specific details of how, you know, um, what life is going to look like for him when he is 18 and beyond. So it's very, very important to continue spreading that awareness and advocating for um, adults with autism. Yeah, because so no, no state keeps programs but past age 24. All states cut off all funding and programs past 24. Oh, one of the core messages I want you to walk out of this beautiful bookstore slash cafe with. <laughs> so many of us operate in a mindset of resource scarcity, where somehow it's like, oh, there's not enough to go around, you get it, I don't, et cetera, et cetera. We are the richest, most advanced economy in the history of the world. We're up to $21 trillion and counting. We have plenty of wealth to be able to treat ourselves and our families well. And for proof of this, do you remember voting for the $4 trillion bailout of Wall Street 10 years ago? Do you remember anyone looking around and saying, where are we going to get the money? I know. No. But when it comes to our children, you're like, hey, you a little help here? They'd be like, no, no. <laughs> Not enough, not enough to go around. One of the reasons why we have to federalize this, this set of issues is because we can't put it in communities' hands to make really difficult choices. Where you say, hey, if I hire one more special needs teacher, then I'm going to have to cut back over here. This is a national priority, and we should fund it at the national level so that communities don't have to rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, thank you for taking my question, uh, Mr. Yang. Uh, my name is uh, Adam. 
I'm actually on the uh, spectrum as well. I'm a parliamentarian for the First District Democrats, and, and I'm on the ADA Advisory Commission for the uh, City of Cedar Rapids. Um, I'm a 41-year-old person with autism, and my question to you, it regards us that are on the more moderate end of the spectrum, and assistance with things such as a day-to-day -day living, um, seeking employment that best suits us. It just seems like right now that those supports are not there. The supports are there with just barely for those that are on the uh, less functional end of the spectrum. But my question for you is, is what are your plans to help us with moderate autism, you know, seek employment, seek those living skills, and seek those, uh, those ideals that give us a path to independence? Well, congratulations. I mean, you, you represent in many ways, I think, what we hope our children grow up to be. I run organizations, and organizations really listen to one set of incentives, the bottom line, really. And so if you want organizations to give more people with moderate autism a chance or a leg up, what you want to do is you want to make it easier to hire that person by subsidizing let's call it the first six months of employment, say, hey, guess what? If you hire someone who's documented to have uh, to be on the spectrum, uh, and then we'll pay half their salary for six months. We'll pay all their salary for six months. And I have a feeling that many employers would then find that that person has a lot to contribute, uh, that maybe they don't interview really well, but they're phenomenal workers. Uh, and as someone who's run organizations, like this is something that would actually be a difference maker because if you if you have an organization, frankly, like you're excited about anything that's going to be that's going to seem to you like you're getting a compelling value. Um, so we have to let employers see that you have a lot to bring to the table, but you can't argue for it from the outside. You have to get that person into the organization right. so they can demonstrate their value yeah. and worth. Yes. yes. That's a great question. It just makes me think. I just agree with you about the move to like AI interviews and things like that, and how that could affect people with disabilities. Yeah, artificial intelligence is about to leave the lab in a real way. Uh, and, and Dina was just asking about AI interviews. They're actually starting to use AI interviews for some big companies to screen folks. And you can imagine what the impact of that would mean for people with special needs. Again, I mean, I was just making a comment that we probably interview in distinct ways. I have a feeling that the artificial intelligence software would read most of it as a lack of interest or, or something that, um, that doesn't exactly enhance your employability. Uh, it's a brave new world, Iowa. I mean, it's like I, I've had conversations. I'm friendly with some of the top technologists in our country, and the more they know, the more concerned they are. I have never had a conversation that went like this. I've been in the lab. I see what's on the cutting edge. I see what's about to hit the American workforce, and it's going to be all right. <laughs> like the second half of that sentence is never that. Uh, like, it, the more you know, the more concerned you are. We all have a vanguard, but the issues that concern us will concern all Americans very, very soon. All right. Okay, another one way back there. Okay. <laughs> we'll get the microphone passed back again. Thank you. Uh, hello, Andrew. I, I, I've seen you many times. This is my fourth time seeing you. I saw you last week. Uh, yeah. My name's Aaron. I'm a senior at high, in high school at West High, which is over there. Yeah. And I and I was diagnosed with autism about a year ago. So I was I was late in comparison to most of these people. I'm 17 right now. I was 16 when I was diagnosed, and I I feel like for me and many other autistic males, like conforming to masculinity is is really hard for a lot of us, and like and we get ostracized for it if we don't. And I think this is an issue that's growing. I think it's getting worse. Unlike the popular opinion that that like gender fluidity is getting better, I think that it's getting worse. I think that it's increased polarization because of social media, because of TikTok, <laughs> that kind of stuff. When you see boys and girls do these exact opposite things, I don't know. I, I feel like it's getting worse. If you're somebody like me, who's who's definitely a male, but isn't isn't like most isn't like most boys, and I think a lot of autistic people deal with that. I don't know, this isn't about the economy, this is just about our culture, but how would, how would we change that? Thank you. 
Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. This is a, an incredible question. And it's a question that applies to many people, not just you. I'm going to say it applies to Christopher as well. Because Christopher, uh, I have a feeling, has a he similar... Have an aggressive bone in he, body. He, he, he doesn't project a lot of conventional, uh, like, boyish behaviors for that way. His, his younger brother takes advantage of him in, in, in some ways. It's like, you don't know how good you have it, Damien. If your, brother, your older brother was a little uh, more normal, he'd be pummeling you for half the stuff you're doing now. <laughs> One of the things I think can help with this uh, conventional masculinity role is that in the White House, Christopher will be right there front and center and people will see that, you know, again, this is the new normal. Uh, and that there are many, many ways to be a strong, uh, strong man that don't involve certain behaviors that you might associate with conventional masculinity. This is an era where I think and so I'm going to speak about this a little bit longer. I think we're seeing challenges with masculinity across the board uh, in many, many different respects. And if you look at it from a very big macro perspective, if you blast away four million manufacturing jobs that were filled two-thirds by men, uh, and you are depressing the labor force participation rate for high school educated men, then you wind up with many people who feel like there's no place for them in the economy. They wind up feeling uh, displaced, and then that manifests itself in, in various ways. So that's, to me, a fundamental challenge. The gun violence challenge is, to me, related to the, to the fact, because we, we have to face facts that 96% plus of the shooters we're concerned about are boys and men, and that our schools, again, are having a really hard time training our boys to become strong, healthy men, and it manifests itself in violence towards women, because we know that strong men treat women well, uh, and we're having a hard time producing strong men at every turn. So to me, strong man does not mean uh, what it might, might have meant in terms of this behavior you're seeing on TikTok. Uh, to me, like a strong man is someone who can uh, be able to, to be introspective in the context of a relationship, uh, to admit their mistakes, to know that that Serving others is actually not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. Acknowledging struggle is a sign of uh, strength, not weakness. Like These, to me, are the things that we have to try and cultivate in boys in particular growing up. It's one of the reasons why I think we should have social emotional learning in every school in the country. So anyway, thank you for coming out and, and seeing me four times. And I have a feeling that you are the, the future of masculinity. That's just my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to say that high school, luckily, doesn't last forever. <laughs> and um, I think there are a lot of people in your shoes. And um, and they and just hearing you talk now, I'm 100% I'm confident that you are going to make um, you know, a woman really happy one day. She's going to be like, I'm so grateful. Or man. Yeah, or, or, <laughs> I mean, or man. I mean, um, so grateful for you as a partner because you are not conventional. You know? and, um, and I think uh, as a society, we're, um, we need to continue to grow to embrace that. Yeah. Yeah. our children you know I hope that one day my sixth grade son would have a chance to meet you yeah look up to we have two more questions we have someone in the front row here hi my name is Kim and I have um, six kids but two of them are uh, have autism and um, one of my concerns um, one of your policies is about a camera for every cop which I love that policy that you want to implement um, but another one I, you know, want to get your feedback on is what about training for our law enforcement, our first responders, to um, people who have special needs? Because that interaction, um, like my always say, is like my they, you know, you know, if someone's with Down syndrome, a cop comes upon someone with Down syndrome, like, oh, okay, they have Down syndrome, you know, and they like respond a different way versus autism, you don't physically see something right off, you know, and those interactions, because if they are verbal, they might 
sound like, oh, they should be able to understand what I'm saying or, yeah. or understand even their rights, if they're read their rights, you know, just because they say it. So some kind of training or something like that. Well, I couldn't agree more with that. I don't know what I'm So the policy that Kim is referring to is that I think we should federally fund body cams for every police officer in the country. Uh, you literally have cameras on every convenience store clerk, you know, and, and the stakes are much lower. Right. You know, so again, this is an instance where you have to get the pressure off of the community because if you're a local police department, you can legitimately say it's like, well, like, do we have the resources for this? It's, it's, it's really a trivial amount of money, like society wide. These cameras are not that expensive. And then if, if you say, look, we'll federally fund these cameras, then you can create a predisposition where everyone assumes that if you're going to interact with a police officer, it's going to be recorded. And that's good for both parties. That's good for us, it's good for them. Um, but that doesn't solve the problem. We need to invest in community policing and training so that they're aware of different neurological profiles, yes, uh, different types of backgrounds and experiences. One thing I would love to do is demilitarize the police departments. Yeah. They're literally getting they're literally getting millions and millions of dollars worth of military hardware into your police department. They're more likely to have a tank than to have someone who's been trained on how to deal with someone with, with uh, autism. You know what I mean? Like, which, which do you need in your community? Uh, so, uh, to me, we have to, to send a clear message that, look, your job is not to, uh, you know, like, is not to occupy us. <laughs> your job is to serve and protect, uh, and, and that happens at the training level, 100%. Many times I wish that there was a button or something that just says I have autism that I can like stick on my son. I gave my son a little card, so yeah. like here, give it to the cop. To, right. Yeah. Because if you um, if you if someone doesn't know you have autism, they will maybe think you're just being hostile. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I just I want to highlight an organization that I'm working with right now um, called Culture City, and they promote sensory inclusion in public spaces like zoos, aquariums, parks, arenas, and they train the staff there um, on you know, what to look out for. It's autism awareness, or uh, actually just all kinds of, there are other types of special needs that have um, sensory sensitivities. Um, but the more that we as a culture can integrate this into our daily lives, the more it bleeds, you know, across um, all categories of, um, you know, professions. Mm -hmm. And I think law enforcement is one that we should really focus on. Renee, stay, raise your hand. Um, because Renee and I, along with Mary Roberts, the director of the um, I, uh, University of Iowa Autism Center, have trained hundreds, over 600 first responders wow, in you. Eastern Iowa. around the country but yes okay well last one last question Conrad yes Where, one okay. more. Danny thank you so much for caring about these issues yes. I can't tell you I'm a mother of a 17 year old son with autism and one thing we were just speaking about the militarization of the police but I also worry about the militarization of our schools our federal funding encourages schools to have SROs by funding it school resource officers, school resource officers on police in the schools I'm wondering, would you advocate, as president, would you be interested in funding schools to have sensory rooms, to have calming rooms where students can choose to go when they need to calm down, rather than counselors seclusion rooms and so forth, <laughs> counselors. It just seems like on a federal level, we can really encourage our schools to make the school structurally inclusive for our children. That's exactly what we should be providing to our schools. I remember when Evelyn and I were notified that our son's school was having an active shooter drill, the first of four during the year, uh, and our younger son is four years old. And so I looked at the data and found that there's no evidence that active shooter drills save lives, yes. but there's, there's copious evidence that it causes anxiety, stress, depression, uncertainty, yes among families, not just the kids, but the parents. Because the kid comes home and is like, hey, I did this drill today. 
Is someone going to come to my school? And then you have to have these conversations. Uh, so this is an example of us swinging the pendulum way too far one way and not the other. I would much rather fund a counselor for a school than a police officer. And I'm going to go on a limb and say the counselor would enhance the safety and security of that school more than the police officer. Would. And as you can tell by the way I frame this, I think active shooter drill should be purely optional uh, unless like a majority of people in that community say we want this, like you should not be mandating that at all. And, and, and there's a culture right now where there's like a, a lot of, frankly, like, oh, let's protect ourselves from, uh, from lawsuits or phantom threats or whatnot. And it's instilled this real culture of fear and anxiety where we need to be actually uh, instilling a sense in our kids that it's okay if they stumble and fail, like a, a culture of resilience and optimism and progress and growth. And acting like we can somehow like drill or protect our, our kids from e every threat is the wrong approach, not just by the numbers, but culturally as well. incredible opportunity. Thank you to everyone who came. We appreciate you so much. It was just wonderful to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. the rules of this country to work for us and our children, but it's going to take all of you here, frankly, in Iowa, lighting the way. The rest of the country is going to look your way. You know the date, February 3rd. It's our chance to make history, and I'm excited to do it alongside you. Hi, everybody. If you would like a picture or selfie, the line is going to start right here in the front where I am standing. And it, all right.